All right, let's get started. So, let's get started. Dave, you got the uh, the book of faces fired up? The book of faces. Is that our phone number? Does anybody know? Okay, so if you guys need to get a hold of us, David and I have been sending people to the Facebook page. So mine's at Dylan S. Borland. And I never realized, conveniently, I'm a real estate guy. My name is Borland. Just realized that. It's interesting. And then at D David, what is yours? Did we ever figure that out? What is it? Your Facebook uh, thing. The David Tupin. The David Tupin? Because I always thought it was like David J. Tupin or something. The David Tupin? I think, I think that, was, that one was taken. So I did that. We go through this every time. I think it's the David Tupin. The David yeah. Tupin? Yeah. For sure. The one and only. I thought it was <laughs> Deep Pocket Dave. Deep Pocket Dave. <laughs> <laughs> the David. You need, if it, if it, all right. I'm going to just take it upon myself to cross this out and just change it to the Deep Pocket Dave because you just have to do that at this point in time. <laughs> So, well, thank you, everybody, for being here uh, on this beautiful April Fool's Day. We didn't have any tricks up our sleeves for you, but um, David did have a good idea. We were going to post a photo of everybody with $1,000 checks and say, if you showed up today, you got $1,000. I thought that was pretty, thought that was pretty interesting. So you are, those of you that are in this room today are going to really, really appreciate this topic because this is a topic that when people say, you know, how do you do so many deals? Um, there's no magic formula. I would say this is probably, other than just hard work and prospecting the consistency, this is the difference between going on 10 appointments and getting one deal or going on 10 appointments and getting seven, eight, nine deals. This topic, we talk about personality styles. This is some really powerful stuff. This is probably closest to a magic pill you're gonna get for anything. So the people that are in this room today, um, this is gold. I can't wait to talk about it. How many people here have heard about personality styles? Raise your hands high. Okay, so there's, I was trained, I think different than the norm. I think the normal training, at least for real estate agents, is a program called DISC training. Has, has anybody heard of DISC? If you were with Keller Williams, you've probably heard of DISC. Jeff, have you heard of DISC training at all? No. Yeah. So I don't use, I, you know, I guess it's called DISC because it's D-I-S-C, but there's another one that the real estate agents use. Same concept, but they're labeled differently. Like we're gonna talk about different personality styles here and the labels are different. I don't know what it is. So I'm gonna teach you my style today. Um, so I wanna start off and s start by saying, Everybody in this room, oh yes, Before thank you. I'm gonna pass around a sheet of paper if you guys all have any questions, non-related or related to this topic. We're gonna you know, record them like we did last time and we'll answer them in our weekly videos that we put out. Yes. So any questions, write as many as you want. I'll pass around. That worked that. really well. So last time we passed around the notepad for people who had questions and if we're sitting there and we hear crickets, we got that. And there were like 34 questions people wrote down. It was great. So. Um, so yeah, so if you have questions, remember today, let me take a few steps back and talk about how many new people do we have in this room? I don't think too many. One, two? Cool. Okay. So this is really a group go coaching session. We like to start with a topic first and then we get into group coaching and that's how can we help you guys? What questions do you have about real estate investing? And it can cover the, the spectrum. It can be single family residential, it could be multifamily, it could be commercial, it could be development. Whatever you guys want to talk about, David and I have a lot of experience in a lot of different categories. So we're here to help you guys, the new people in this room. So don't be shy. If you have a question, that's what we're here for. This is a group coaching session. What can we do to help take your business to the next level? Um, but I am going to take another step back because you reminded me with that. A couple of reminders. No meetup next month. Dave and I are going to be traveling the world like Carmen San Diego. Any better remember that? Carmen San Diego. Come on, guys. Um, so we won't be here. So uh, no meeting in May. So they'll resume. Stay away in May. Stay, that's a good analogy. Stay away in May. They'll resume the uh, following month. And then the other thing David and I have wanted to bring up to everybody is we're going to start um, a monthly group coaching inner circle. So uh, this has really came about because we have a lot of people that want to get involved in our one-on-one -on -one coaching. David and I limit it. I limit myself to just six coaching clients at a time. I don't know what your limit is, David, but um, 
because of that, it's usually pretty full. So we do, we got to start a group coaching inner circle where we get together, what did we say, like once a month? With uh, yeah. people here locally? Like a two hour thing, one or two, probably a two hour thing once a month. Yeah, yeah. and we're, it's going to be the same content as if you were doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, but just once a month instead of like sharing you're involved in one-on-one. -on -one. Um, instead of just uh, once a week, which you get, it'll be once a month. So if anybody's interested in that, let us know, okay? Because um, we'll probably be putting that out through f Meetup, not through Facebook, through Meetup. Yeah, okay? You should write, write your email down on Meetup. All right. So, everybody in this room is a personality style. And when we talk about personality styles, let me write this down on the board for you guys because I have a really cool diagram here. Um, so fa is the book of faces, can they catch this? Facebook. Is anybody tuned in? Facebook's got it. Are they all sleeping? Good morning, everybody. You got two people watching. Nice. I'm going to try to write this as big as I can. This is a really handy chart. So you guys might want to follow me on this and write this down. So we have here D for Dylan, no, driver, driver. We have C for analytical, okay, don't ask me how to spell, you spelling, what do they call those, Nazis, spelling Nazis, don't ask me how to spell, expresses, I for express, I don't know why I is expresses, but it is. Expressive, S for amiable, okay, and now we got these cool little arrows here, and we'll explain what all this means in a minute, but they basically go like this, just, if you guys are following along, this is play along series, just write this down, so, they have those letters, I think I just looked it up. It's dominant, influential, steady, and conscientious. Okay, so that's what it means. My labels are just different. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, we also have this, which is like a little X. So just take this chart down, and then we're going to explain what this means. So we have here, we have low emotions. Logical thinkers. Okay. Here we have, can you guys see? Let me take a step back. Here we have high emotions, feelers. So high emotions, now I can't write vertical. So I'm gonna write it to the side, but on my little chart it's vertical. But we have slow decision makers. Right, and that goes up and down. So it's encompassing these two. And then over here you have quick decision makers. Quick decision makers. Okay. So Everybody in this room, everybody in this room is a personality style. Does anybody know what they are? And we'll talk about what these are in a second, but does anybody know what they are? An analytical, driver, expressive, amiable. For example, David and I are high analyticals. Okay? So everybody in this room is one category. The reason why this training is so important is because in sales, what happens is when you're out selling to people, you are selling to people as yourself naturally. If I'm selling to somebody who's a driver, and I don't know, I haven't, I haven't pinned Jeff, but let's just say Jeff is a driver, I'm actually gonna be repulsive to Jeff if I'm just acting as my normal self. And that's what people don't understand, is that when you're selling to people as your normal personality style, people are what we call tribal people. Has there ever been a situation where you've been in a group or you've been in a meeting with somebody and you're like, man, this guy is weird. You might be thinking that about me, right? This guy is weird because he's not part of your tribe. He's not your personality style is what we call it. You're not in their tribe, right? So what's the old saying? Birds of a feather flock together. That's human beings, guys. And so the analyticals, there's a reason why Dave and I get along so well, both analyticals. 
We're repulsive to 75% of the population. <laughs> we really are, right? I, I don't know your guys' personality styles, but Eric, Eric may be an amiable. He's repulsive to the other three categories. And so when you're not conscious of this in sales and you're going out on appointments and you're trying to do deals and you're selling as your natural self, you're actually repelling 75% of the people you're going on appointments with. That's why it is so important to understand these because when you can understand how different personality styles think, act, feel, and you can become them and they say to you, man, Jeff is just like me. He gets it. He's part of the tribe. And what they don't know is that Jeff is just being a good sales guy and he's acting just like them because he understands personality styles. What you guys want to do is you want people to say, man, this Dylan is just like me. Right? He understands it. He gets it. That's why this training is so important. This is, this is awesome stuff. This is the difference of if you go on 10 appointments, you're going to get 9 out of 10, or at least 7 out of 10, right? We, we did this a lot as real estate agents. This is, uh, when we're talking and prospecting to people, it goes much deeper than this because the last thing I'm going to cover with you guys is what we call mirroring and matching, pers uh, not just the personality styles, but tones, inflections, rate of speech, postures, that type of stuff, and we'll get into that last. But let's talk about what these are. So we'll start with an analytical. So I, for example, David and I are high analyticals. What do you guys think that means? Come on, group participation. What do you guys think that means? Numbers, Numbers and facts. figures Numbers. and facts. Who do you think are a lot of high analyticals? What type of job category? Engineers. 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 Right? <laughs> Anybody here not an analytical and can't stand and want to throw up when they think about engineering? Or, or when people say, when you're trying to do a sales deal with an engineer, and you're not an analytical, what do you feel? Like, oh my god, I want to strangle this person. Just get it done. <laughs> he, just, he, just, he just shot himself in the head back there. He's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? They're repulsive to you. So analyticals are, are people who, who need to know all the numbers, the figures, the facts. They're people who are never going to make a decision they have to come to the decision themselves, right? They have to look and take and collect all the information and say thank you. If they're out shopping for a new washing machine, you're never going to sell them on the spot. They got to go and look on Amazon. They got to compare prices. They got to go here. They got to go there. They got to look at this model, that model, the efficiency of this one, the price in that one, right? They do a whole analysis. And then they'll come back to you after analysis and they'll say, this is what I want. But analyticals are numbers and facts. So these categories mean what? An analytical is a slow decision maker. You got to keep that in mind. If you're on an appointment with an analytical and you're trying to close them on the spot, what do you think is going to happen? No sale. No sale. You lost them. Now, you could that could be a great deal. That could be a good fix and flip deal that you guys could close, but you're not going to close it. Because you're trying to close, you, you think, people think of sales, they think this fast, slick, I'm going to close, I'm going to get the contract before I leave. Right? That will work for a driver. It's not going to work for an analytical. So when you're on appointments, you guys want to pay attention to this stuff and understand where they're coming from. And so I may go to an analytical and I may say, hey, Sharon, would it be helpful if I went back to you after our meeting today and I sent you all the comps in the neighborhood and I sent you what I would be putting into this house? And I shared all that data with you. I put all my cards on the table up front. You know what I'm going to make on this property and vice versa, right? But what I want to do is, is, is I want to get that information in your hands so that you can make an informed decision. Do you think that'd be helpful for you? Hell yes. Right? And somebody like, data exactly, right? We eat that up. And so an analytical is going to love that stuff. And so when we sell analyticals, Dave and I will send them all the data ahead of time. I'll say, Sharon, the first thing I want to do is send you all this information ahead of time, and then I want to call, follow, call and follow up with you the next day to discuss it. Would that be helpful for you? Right? And you'll get an analytical every time like that. Right? We just got a deal, which we passed over to Sharon and her team, where the homeowner was a high analytical. It was a $275,000, $290,000 house in Farmington Hills. The guy sold it to us for 188 because we sold to him as a person, as a, as a analytical. He was an engineer.
and I could present it to them, and I knew that going into it, and I could present it to them and say, this is why our offer is 188000 Boom, 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 boom. And, and they understand, right? David had a scenario. David, do you want to share your scenario? I think this would probably be important for the group. Okay. No, remember that one in Lincoln Park that you did where the lady was in analytical? Oh, yeah. I, I initially had sold her, or given her the offer as uh, more of like a driver, I would say. And she was totally repulsed and turned off by the end of the call. It was She just acted like it was totally different from what we had talked about in our walkthrough. and. Because she, she came in, yeah. and she wanted what, like 40000 for a house in Lincoln yeah. Park, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I offered her, I think her offer was fifteen or 15000 15000 like Which obviously we knew, you know, was going to be surprising to her at first. And I sold it to her the wrong way, as the wrong personality type, not realizing she was an analytical. And by the end of the call, she was um, completely, you know, turned off by it. She wanted Hung to up the phone, it. practically, and said, don't ever call us again. Yeah, never call us again. So I... <laughs> I shot her an email. Yeah. I, you know, I said, hey, you know, I apologize if that was totally not what you're looking for. Let me explain why this is what it is, and that's what she was looking for. Is is not, you know, what can you give me? It's what's your reasoning behind it? Uh, how do you justify what you're telling me? Because you know, she's not a real estate professional. She doesn't understand. So I sent her all the data, the comps to support it. Uh, what our numbers are going to yeah. be, what our renovations need to be, and uh, got her back on the phone, and we got it done at sixteen thousand. Sixteen five, something so, like that, right? Yeah, and that was just you know uh, the whole thing there was going at it the right way and, and using the right direction. Yeah. So if um, was that your initial phone call? No, that we had uh, we had done a phone call or two, set up yeah. an appointment, and then um, I had given her a call back after the appointment with the offer. I think that was probably the. Third or fourth that's, contact. That's what yeah. I was wondering. If, there, if you identified somebody on your initial call as a driver, would you push to an offer right away? No. Maybe? No. Never? And that's a good question. So, David and, yeah. David and I. And David's actually going to come up after I in a minute, and he's going to talk about a few other key pointers when we talk about sales. But we never discuss price and terms on the phone. Instead, we focus on motivation and ability to sell, right? The name of the game is to get out on appointments and get people committed. When you get people committed to the appointment, you get people committed to a contract, they're much more likely to go backwards on you. And so when you're dealing with properties, you know, I've seen people in this group that deal with properties in Detroit, for example, and they go through an appointment and they try to get the deal on the spot. That may make sense in a place like Detroit, but the rest of the world, it doesn't make sense. Right? And so we never discuss price and terms because you're not going to get any. We don't handle objections on the call. We tell a homeowner that's a great question. Prices are changing every day. I don't know. I haven't seen the house. The first thing I have to do is come out and evaluate the property. Right? The more time you get people, the more time you take from people and you, and you interact with them and you build the rapport and you get them engaged, then uh, the more committed they're going to be to working with you. They've never met you on an initial phone call. It's, again, it's repulsive to them. If you're just on the phone call and just say, I don't want to waste my time, I'll offer you like 50000 what do you think? What do you think they're going to say? With the exception of Detroit. <laughs> and I'm being serious because it, that's, how it, that's how it works in Detroit real estate. Right? You could say, oh, I'm going to offer you 2000 for your house, would you take it? And the person may say yes. Right? But in the suburbs, it doesn't work that way. In a lot of other areas around the country, it doesn't work that way. And I bring that up because I hear a lot of the people that are doing the prospecting and stuff in the Detroit market right now. But anybody has it. The goal is, is and Sharon, I think we've been over this in coaching, is, is you don't want to handle objections on that phone call. Because it's a losing battle. You'll never win. You'll just, you'll, the person will just say, ah, I'll think about it. And then what they're really saying is, I don't want to do a deal with you. Right? So with the driver on the first call, you're still staying aggressive and quick. You, you're saying, I'm going to get right back. Yeah, let me do some exactly. So for a driver, you're going to be aggressive. You're going to quick. And I say, you know, uh, let's just make up a name. So, hey, Tom, you know, I understand uh, time is very valuable to you, and I don't want to waste your time. So I'm going to make this very efficient for you. The first thing we're going to do is come out and evaluate the property. I won't give you any BS. I'll, call up, I'll follow up with you in the next 24 hours with an offer. Does that make sense? Right, And so a lot of the key words that you're going to be using, we'll talk about drivers in a minute, are let me cut right to the point. Right, You wouldn't do that with an analytical. If you're calling with an annual ball, it's going to be exactly the opposite. You exactly. take three or four or five, six calls just to get that appointment. Right. But so. in Dave's example that he used, this is when Dave first joined the team. It was his first week. Mm -hmm. And I went back to him and I said, Dave, you're not approaching their personality. you got to approach it and understand their personality styles. That's a, what I'm telling you guys is that's a deal that was a dead deal that was saved and done because he reapproached them 
based on the personality style. The lady said, literally, don't ever call me again. She was so insulted. Right? Now, what would most people do? They would say, ah, that homeowner is an idiot. Right? Next. We got the deal. Because we reapproached it. So that's the other thing is if you guys got deals on your plate right now that you made offers to and the person and you know that a deal could be done, this lady owned the house free and clear. Right? When you deal with a homeowner who owns it free and clear and they have high motivation to sell and they're telling you, no, I don't want to do a deal, what do you think the real problem is? You. you. <laughs> right? So if you guys have ever had that happen to you and you still have these leads and deals on your plate, go back and revisit them right now. And try to understand their personality style and call them back and say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, let me, would it be helpful if they're analytical if I better explain this to you? Right? Go ahead, Sharon. So when you're talking to somebody in a very short period of time, yeah. when they first answer the phone to even try to figure out, so what tips would you give to try to figure out which category to put them in? That's a good question. So let's talk about some of the key words. Hold, hold that thought. Let's talk about some of the key words that these people use because you're going to be able to pick up on that in those few seconds on their first call, right? So you'll know if somebody's talking about, you could ask them, what do you do for a living? And if they say, I'm an engineer at Ford, what do you think they are, right? And so we'll be able to pick up on those key words and determine on the phone call, on the initial phone call, what do we think this personality style is going to be? Amiables, for example, are very emotional people. And so they're going to use a lot of, a lot of emotional words when they describe their property, right? So I'll, you'll pick up on that. You'll get some keywords and stuff we'll use. But just keep in mind, uh, analyticals are also low emotions, logical thinkers. So analyticals are like robots. They don't care. David and I don't care about emotions. And it's probably a bad human trait, but it just doesn't matter though. We just, we're, well, <laughs> you know, and sometimes people, ah, you're not sensitive, you don't care. It's like, no, we just, it just got to make sense on a performa. That's it, right? It's like marriage. If it makes sense on the performa, I'm in, right? <laughs> Which it rarely does. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so they're logical thinkers and they're low emotions. You'll see people in this group that are illogical thinkers, like expressives. Okay? So let's move on from that. So though analyticals, you're gonna to wanna to sell to them, and when you guys are selling to them and you're presenting them an offer, send them everything, guys. I've gotten 100% of analyticals uh, on the deals that we present because I present them everything. They even see what I'm gonna make on the house. And I just tell them, hey, at the end of the day, I got to make a 20% return on my capital. My offer to you is, is going to encompass that. They understand that. They get it. They know you're going to be spending 200,000. You got to make a return on your money. Analyticals understand this stuff. Don't be, if, if you send them a performa and it says you're going to make 60 grand, for analytical, it's not going to matter if you can explain it. You can go to them and say, I have to make 20% return on my capital. That's why my offer is what it is. Yeah, $60,000 is a 20% return for the risk involved. Would you spend $300,000 to make, you know, 60? Did they understand that stuff? So don't be scared to share every, the more information you share with analytical, the, the, the better they're gonna to wanna to do a deal with you, okay? And remember, if you're, if you're an expressive, you try to sell analytical, you gotta become an analytical. You gotta learn how they think, how they talk, how they act. Their numbers and figures, you want them to think Man, this expressive, you know, you want to become them. It's just like me. Become an analytical for that moment when you talk to them. Then go back to being your repulsive self, right? <laughs> That's how I was taught. Let's talk about amiables. So amiables are people who uh, feel a lot. They're very emotional people. They cry all the time. Are there amiables in this room? There probably is. Tell you, Colleen, I, I would probably pin you as an amiable. Not that you you're, cry all the time. No, you're right. But you're very um, caring. You're probably a very supportive person. You like to be in a supportive role, I would imagine. Yeah. Right? You say a lot of, um, emo uh, your conversations involve a lot of emotions. And uh, the amiables, you can always spot an amiable because they're typically people when you walk into the house or you walk into the room, they ask, do you want water or do you want a coffee or can I make you a bagel with some cream cheese, right? There, when you walk into a house, a homeowner ever ask you, can I get you something to drink? 
You guys aren't walking through enough houses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, Boom, that's an amiable. And so when you sell to an amiable, you're using emotions. You're saying, man, let's just make up fictitious names. We're going to use Tim. We're going to use Tim and Marie today. Right? You say, man, Marie, you know what? You've probably put a lot of time and energy into this house, haven't you? You raised your family. You get into emotional conversations with them. You raised your family here. You raised little Johnny, the dog Pepper. Let's call him Pepper, right? You're going to talk about emotional things with, with an amiable. And you're going to go to an amiable, and what's going to be most important to them is not about the money that they're going to make or not make on the property. What's most important to an amiable is the fact that it's going to a trustworthy person and to a good home. I can assure you, Marie, that we're going to take care of this house just like you have for the last 25 years. We're going to make sure that a good family ends up in this property and takes care of it and maintains it just like you have. Right? Those are the conversations that we have with amiables. What were you going to say, Dave? That's, that's quite a Right? You can rest assured this house is going to be in great hands. Okay? They're emotional people. And so when you sell to them, and we're trying to get out their motivation, because the number one thing that we focus on in sales is what's their motivation. With amiables, it's great because you can really take that motivation and keep stabbing it in their side because they feel it. Analyticals aren't going to feel it. But with the amiables, you've got to extract that motivation out of them. Why are they selling? What's important to them about selling? Well, I want to go spend time with my son who's in New York. Right? I want to go move out to New York with my son. Well, if I could put together an offer that made sense and got you out to your son in the next 30 days, do you think that would make sense? Right? Ultimately, what's getting out to New York going to do for you and your family? We're bringing up emotions. Right? Is it going to allow you to spend time with your son? How much more time are you going to be able to spend with him? How nice would it be to be sitting there on the weekends and know you don't got to travel to New York? Stay in front of that table. Stay here? Yeah, don't walk past the table. Okay. I can't walk past this table? No. Not that. Oh. Can I move the table? Every month it's the same thing. Every month. Yeah, put it there. Yeah. There you go. Right? But you're going to use emotions when you sell to them. You're going to use emotions so you sell to them. Now, somebody like Sharon doesn't give a crap about emotions because she's an analytical like me, right? And it's repulsive to think about it. But when you're dealing with an amiable, they can pick up on that. And so you got to start to train yourself to act like you care about their emotions. Right? This isn't just numbers for them like it is for us. This is a very emotional decision. They raised a family in this house. They spent a lot of time here. They put a lot of money into this. You ever walk through a house, the homeowner takes you through, and it looks like crap. But the, man, I put like 50000 into this kitchen, and, and uh, Uncle Bill came over and helped me. We erected this garage out of, out of logs, and right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to hit you a few times until you Just get throw it. a pen at me. Right? So, so when you're selling to them, keep in mind, though, they're high emotions, but they're also still slow decision makers. You're not going to be able to go to an amiable and close the contract on the spot. You know what? These are actually the longest decision makers. You may have to spend weeks, months, holding these people's hand. It's going to be okay. These are the people who trust issues really come up a lot too, right? Yeah. <coughs> How can I trust you? Is this a scam? Is something going to happen to me? Right? How am I getting swindled here? Right? So you got to build a lot of trust with these guys. These are the guys who, when we send marketing out to them, or we communicate with them, we're sending them postcards of our team, everybody on it, so that we feel like one big happy family. Right? The drivers, analyticals, don't care about any of that crap, but the amiables love it. Right? Got a nice little group photo. Here we are. We're all part of the family. Right? But that's going to lose. That's going to lose sales, though, too. Well, it, it will. It will repulse 75%. But if we do a follow-up, if we do a follow-up with an amiable, we say, hey, can I send you some information on my team and ourselves? We know it's an amiable. Then we're unloading all of that on them. We don't do mass mailings like that. 
But you got to remember. <laughs> See? So I would say you're probably a driver. Right? And somebody like that, like, you is just, you're repulsed. Oh, my God. Yeah, you'll throw up in your mouth. Well, you, you won't get the appointment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so when we talk about mailing to them, we're not doing it on, we're not doing that on a mass market, but if we're on the phone with somebody, remember, amiables take time to work and season. Out of any category on this block here, they take a really long time, and you have to build the trust. And if you can understand that, you'll get the deal. You get a really good deal, <laughs> right? And if and if they, yeah, if they think you know you're part of my family, right? Is what you want them to feel. It's not about the money for them. It's never about that for an amiable. They'll take a hundred thousand dollar loss on a house if they feel like you're their sister or their brother. Okay, so keep that in mind. But they take people have the wrong idea and they think they're going to sell this person after the first or second phone call. They, these guys bunker down. Because there, it's a dating process. It's a dating process. It really, really is. Out of any category. These guys are pretty quick. Once you give them the numbers, the figures, and the facts, they're good. These guys are a dating process. Okay? Expressives. Expressives. How do we know who an expressive is? Because expressives... People may category me as an expressive, but I'm not. I'm analytical. They love themselves. They are so in love with themselves. Now, I love myself, but I'm not an expressive. Expressives are the guys who usually see fit wearing the latest clothing trend, all the accessories. They got the suits on. They look like Benjamin Button or whatever, right? They got the fancy, the best shoes. They're shined, the best watches. They got the hair, the slick hair. They're driving the Maserati. Expressives are materialistic people, generally speaking. That's how you spot an expressive. And they never shut up, ever. They don't stop talking, expressives, right? And so that, so Sharon, when you're talking, how do we identify people if it's over the phone? Expressives love to talk about themselves or what they've been doing, or their life, or their history. Those are expressives. And you know what you do? You just feed them more. You know what? You are the great, who are we using, Timmy, today? Timmy, you are the greatest person that, that God has ever made. You are fantastic. I cannot believe you are so smart. And I'm over-exaggerating, but you guys understand what I'm saying. You have to feed into their ego with expressives. If I sell to an expressive, I'm going to say to them, Hey, Timmy, I don't have to tell you. You already know. Right? And then they go with whatever you say. Yeah. Timmy, I don't have to tell you. You already know what houses are selling for in the neighborhood. I don't have to tell you. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. Yeah. Whether they do or not. Yeah. Right? Those are your expressives. You went there early. Yeah. <laughs> you can always get an expressive if you just feed into them. Now, for me, as an analytical, it's repulsive. Right? But if you just play into their ego, you're the smartest. You are the greatest person. Where'd you get that suit, by the way? Where'd you get that Tommy Hill figure? Oh my God. You are, no, and I'm being serious, guys. These are the conversations you have with expressives. And then when you sell to them, keep in mind, expressives are high emotion. You ever been in a conversation with a person and they're really, really nice one moment, and the next minute they flip out? Now, that is also called being bipolar, I believe. <laughs> You had what? I had a boyfriend like that. You had a boyfriend like that? He was probably also an expressive. <laughs> I would imagine. It was, it was, I think. Yes. Expressives are like that. And you've got to understand that's just how they are. Right? we got one right now that we're dealing with. The one minute you talk to the guy and he's fine, he's the greatest guy on the earth, and the next minute you go, whoa, what happened? Yeah. Right? Just understand that, though. Just understand that that's how they are, and that's okay. Right? That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So they're high, high emotions, but they're also quick decision makers. They make decisions really fast, guys. And so an expressive may be somebody, not like a driver, but they may be somebody who you could push to do a deal on the spot if you can make them feel like they came to that decision. You make them feel like they came to that decision. Right? T Timmy, if you were me, what would you offer for this property? Right? I don't have to tell you, Timmy, you already know this house needs $30,000, don't you? 
Right? These are the conversations we have with expressives. Okay? Now the reason why I have these arrows here is because when you're on an appointment with a husband and a wife, or in today's world, a husband and a husband, or a wife and a wife, right? Let's be politically correct. The opposite, they're usually opposite from each other. So if you're, typically, if you're speaking with a husband who's an expressive, his wife, if you're trying to figure out what is, who his wife is, she may be an analytical, or vice versa. If you're dealing with somebody who's a driver, their wife may be an amiable. And I would, I would bet money, knowing Jeff and his wife, that his wife is probably an amiable. Because I've, I've learned about your wife. She does the music and all that stuff. Yeah. Right? And so it's, it's very common that your opposite is from each other. So if you're at the table with a husband and a wife, and somebody, so if you're literally sitting at a table, we used to do this as real estate agents all the time, and husband and wife are sitting there, I'm talking to Jeff as a driver, and then I'm switching and I'm talking to his wife as an amiable. Right? What's that? It's it complicated. Gets it complicated, but you get used to it. It gets used to it. We used to do little exercises in sales training where we would break and we'd go out for lunch and we would try to see who could get more food or little extras or discounts on their meal and stuff by appealing to the server's personality styles. And we used to try, we used to screw with them. And I got a whole extra basket of, of fries for free because the lady was an expressive and I was just killing her. I was just like, where'd you get those earrings from? Those are beautiful. My God. I got a whole basket of fries for free. So don't be, you know, experiment with this, guys. It doesn't have to just be out on appointments, right? This is real world stuff. This is everyday stuff. Everybody in this room is a different personality style. So just play with it, right? And then as you're communicating, people start to say, I wonder what he is. I wonder what he is, right? All right, we'll see ya. You left on the drivers, which you don't need anyway. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Um, okay, so now let's talk about drivers. So that's really self-explanatory. A driver is no BS. They don't. These people here could all, the whole world could die. Mass extinction and drivers would be happy if it was just drivers left in the world. <laughs> Less traffic. <laughs> Less traffic. <laughs> right? Dri drivers are a... They're, they're, they're another breed, okay? So, uh, so drivers, they don't need explanation. They're, they, do not screw around with a driver. Like Jeff is saying, if you screw around with a driver, you're, you're, you got one shot. You'll turn them off real quick. Real fast, and they ain't coming back. A driver is no BS. Somebody like Jeff, uh, if, if I'm, and Jeff, do you mind if I say, well, you probably don't what you do. I don't know what you're doing with the money. <laughs> but Jeff lends hard money, right? Or did or doesn't. I don't know if you want me to advertise that. But Jeff Laird's hard money. If somebody comes to Jeff and they have this big fancy marketing package and this whole story behind them and, and everything that's going on, all these photos and pictures, what are you going to do? They got about five seconds. They got about five seconds. I'll, I'll, I'll read five seconds of it before you know. Right. It's not going to work for somebody like you. You're going to say, hit the bricks. Too much fluff. Well, it's too much fluff. I, I won't. Instead, to somebody like Jeff, I'm going to go right to the meat and bones. It's going to be one page. And I'm going to say, this is what you can make on this investment. I don't want to waste you, Jeff. I could sit down and I could spend 15 minutes of your time talking about all this fluff and junk. But Jeff, I know you. That's not important to you. You don't, you don't care about any of that, do you? So let me get right to the point. Now, how would that conversation go? Better. A lot better, right? Yeah. With a driver. And you got to remember, everybody is another personality style under stress, by the way. So analyticals tend to be, if you are around David and I, you'll know, under stress, we're drivers. Or in business situations. Or in business situations. Right? Don't, don't give me any BS. Get right to it. You got five seconds. Right? Because we ain't got the time. So everybody is another personality style under stress, typically, when you're stressed. Or in business, you know, often you're stressed sometimes. So a driver is, hey, when we're communicating with them, even on the phone, it's, hey, you know what, your time's valuable, Jeff, let me get right to the point. Or you know what, hey, I'll be brief. You're on a, on a phone call with somebody. Hey, Timmy, I want to keep calling him Tommy. Hey, Timmy, you know what? I know your time's valuable to you. I'll be brief. A driver's going to pick up the phone and they're going to say, what do you want? Who is this? They're going to be really short. Right? You got 0.5 seconds. 
to catch their attention. And so if I pick up a phone and somebody's, uh, I can tell real quick out of the just real blunt and brief, just the first words out of their mouth, I can, I'll guess and I'll say this person's probably a driver and I'll say, hey, you know what? Um, uh, I don't want to take up a lot of your time. I'll be brief. Those are the first words out of my mouth when I'm talking to a driver. It's funny because a lot of people lose it on phone calls. Exactly. They, they, they call me and they, I, I, don't, I don't usually say who I am. Mm -hmm. They call my phone number, I ask who they are. If they don't answer me. That's a key most, indicator of a driver. Most people won't answer. Yep. They'll say what they're selling. Yep. I'm done. Yep, I click. Asked, I asked him a simple, simple question yep. and they couldn't tell me. So somebody like Jeff picks up the phone and he's not going to say, you're, he's going to say, you called me, who is this? Right. Yeah. These are key words of drivers, guys. And, and then you pick up on it and you say, hey, you know what? Let me cut right to the chase. Let me be brief. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was trained. Hello, this is Rob. Is that, is that how you operate or no? What's that? When, when, when I call somebody and they answer, I'm just, hello, this is Rob. Huh? Like when somebody's calling you? Calling me or I call them, you know, and they first thing, you know, hello, this is Rob Howard. Just introduce myself right off, get it right out of the way. Uh, no, well, you're so we work off, that's another topic, but we work off of scripts and dialogues, right? And so we'll have a set script depending on who we're prospecting, right? And it's going to be a different conversation. It may not just be, hello, this is Dylan. Well, who, the driver's going to say, well, who the hell is Dylan? He don't care, right? And so you got to be willing to adapt to that. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, when somebody calls me, I never answer my phone. I never take live phone calls because I don't put myself on other people's agendas. I control my schedule and I control my time. Right? I never take live phone calls because I'm, I'm focused on what I'm doing at that time and place. And if I'm in the middle of prospecting and generating business, which is why we're all here, because this isn't a nonprofit, and I'm prospecting, somebody calls me in the middle of prospecting, and now I got a problem at one of my properties or there's some drama here or there, what do you think is going to happen to your income? Yep. Right? Jeez. Now you, I don't even check my phone's off, my cell phone's off, my email browser is not even open, nothing. Right? I'm in the moment. I don't operate on other people's agendas because they're not in charge of my income, I am. Right? I don't put my, my income in, in their hands. And we deal, we talk about that with coaching clients all the time. So, um, but yes, with the driver, there's really not much explanation. They're quick decision makers, there are zero emotions, and they're logical thinkers. So with them, it's right to the point. If you got somebody who picks up the phone and says, who is this? You called me. Hey, let me cut right to the point. And when we talk about sales, guys, you want to have scripts and dialogues, and you want to have ways on how you respond to these different personality styles. Because people are going to say, well, then what do I say? Right? you got to be prepared for that on the call. So if you guys can learn and understand and master this stuff, right now you're acting as your normal self. So in your normal course of daily life, you are literally repulsive to 75% of the population, whether you think so or not. I know we all think we're special. But to 25% but to of the population, we're special. Oh, we really are. So when you start to, in sales, we're not talking, it's like acting, guys. We're not talking about changing who you are as a person fundamentally. We're saying that when you're around other people, s try to pick up on their personality styles and, s and sell to their personality styles. You want them to think this person is just like me, right? And the other things that we can do in combination to all this is we pick up on what we call um, mirroring and matching, mirroring and matching. Um, tones and inflections. Remember, I'm going to put a keyword here, guys. I'm going to put a keyword here. Bye, Timmy. Bye, Marie. You guys are done for the day. Thank you. Um, tribe. You want to be a part of their tribe is what all this is about. You don't want to be an outsider. You don't want to be an outcast. You want to fit into their tribe. When you show up at the gates, you want them to say, hey, welcome, brother. Welcome, sister. You're just like me, whether you are or not. Maybe a wolf in sheep's clothing. Right? Tones. So we said tones and inflections. And then we body posture as well, too. So the easiest way to get in rapport with people when you're there in person Let's talk about over the phone first is inflections.
voice. If you're on the phone with somebody and you're prospecting to a homeowner, you're gonna, the easiest thing you can do, personality, styles aside, is mirror and match their tones and their inflections. If you're on the phone with somebody who's a slow talker and you're talking fast, what do you think they're thinking to themselves? What is this guy going to hang out? He's a slickster, this guy. He's a snake oil salesman. They're trying to hear if you get off the phone. Right? If I'm on the phone and Eric Kelly's a slow talker, his inflections, hey, this is Eric. Uh, hey, Eric, this is Dylan over at the Born Group. How are you doing today? What am I doing? I'm repulsive to him. So when somebody picks up the phone, I'm going to match their tonality, their inflections, their rate of speech. And I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to adjust instantly. Hey, Eric, it's Dylan over at the Portland Group. How are you today? His guard's already down. Step one. Right? I used to prospect. People don't know this, but when I, when I was on a mad mission to save money to invest in real estate, because nobody would give me a loan, I worked my ass off to hoard as much money as I could, and I would work a full time during the day um, prospecting here as a real estate agent to take listings, sell it, feed it into my investment properties. Then I would prospect, I did this for a year, out in California, LA, Los Angeles, because they have a time difference. So I would start six to nine on prospect in California. And when I prospected in California, we'd get a lot of Spanish people. I don't know the first thing about Spanish, but I know how to mirror and match. And so when I had somebody on the phone who was Spanish, I sounded Spanish, as silly as it sounds. Right? People would answer the phone and say, bueno. I don't know what bueno is. Are there any Spanish speakers in this room? Does it mean good morning or something? What does bueno mean? Hello. Hello? I'd go, bueno. Right? I, I'm mirror and matching them. I would try to make myself sound Spanish. Right? You got a Mexican on the phone. Sound Mexican. You got a Chinese person on the phone, sound Chinese. You're thinking, no, seriously, you're thinking in your head it may sound silly. On the phone, it doesn't. You wouldn't do that in person. You wouldn't go to a Chinese person and I can talk about Chinese. My wife is Chinese, right? And uh, uh, so I can talk about the Chinese. But um, I wouldn't go to a Chinese person. I wouldn't act silly and be acting like a Chinese person, you know, with my tonality in front of them right now. But you can on the phone. You can absolutely on the phone, right? So um, keep that in mind. That's one of the easiest ways to get in rapport with people is just simply match their tonality, their rate of speech, their inflections. Somebody's talking really fast, you're talking really fast. Somebody's talking really slow, you're talking really slow. Somebody has an accent, you're talking with an accent. And you can do that subtly in person. Right? I do that. Dave does it all the time. So the other thing is that when you're on appointments and stuff with people and you're sitting at a table with somebody or around somebody, and you notice somebody, let me give you an example, you notice somebody sitting at a table, and uh, this is how you get in their tribe, guys. Somebody's sitting at a table, and Colleen right now is sitting here like this. What am I going to do? I'm going to subtly sit like this. Right? And then she shifts, she may go like this, and sit, or David may go like this and sit like this. Oh, 10, 15 seconds down the road. If you guys watch me and how I operate, if you've ever been one-on-one -on -one with me, you'll know I'm, I'm doing this to you. I'm going to shift, and I'm going to sit like this. And what you're not realizing is the subconscious mind is picking up on all this. Right? And their, their guard's going down. They're saying, man, this Dylan is just like me. He moves like me. He talks like me. <laughs> right? He understands me. Right? But I've been doing this now for 10 years, so it's just, it's like breathing for me. So I do it now without even thinking about it, really. It's just ingrained in me. Right? But when I'm communicating with people, I'm communicating. Sorry, guys, wake up call. I'm communicating to you based on your personality style and your inflections and your tonalities. People say, man, sometimes Dylan's so charismatic. No. I'm just like you. <laughs> Each and every one of you. <laughs> Right? And it's not a bad thing, guys. We're not talking about, you know, I guess maybe in a way we are manipulating people. I don't know. I didn't notice that until you started teaching me it. But my, that's, I think that's why sales came naturally to me. Is my entire life, I'd always yeah. consciously mirrored and matched everyone I talked to. Right. Doesn't matter who they were, friend, you know, friends, family members. That's always what I did. And I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize it, but I think that's why sales kind of came naturally. I mean, yep. it works. It, it works. When you guys learn this stuff and you learn how to master this stuff, you can, it's like, 
you can control a lot of situations. You get a lot more deals than, than you can even imagine possible. I would imagine there's been deals throughout your guys' history right now that you could have very well had if you were simply focused on what personality that person was. Right? Anybody in this room think that armed with this information you could probably do an extra deal or two? Absolutely. Let me give you, let me give you an example. Um, when you're dealing with foreclosures, nobody in, foreclo nobody in the situation of being in, going through a foreclosure likes banks. So we, yeah. always, we always act like we hate banks. You know, I really do hate banks. Just things like that. Sorry, bankers. So we say that, <laughs> you dislike something, yeah. you dislike it as well. Because yeah. you going against them or doing the opposite is automatically You're repelling to them. Uh, taking yourself out of their tribe. Right? Mm -hmm. So somebody's got a little dog. I don't like dogs. Right? But somebody's got a little dog. Oh, I love that dog. Where'd you get that dog? It's a great dog. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yorkie Poodle? Oh, man, they're my favorite type of dog. How did you know? I, I had one when I was growing up. Exactly. I had one when I was, yeah, and use a story. I had one when I was growing up. Oh. Yeah, okay. I kicked him out the window, but. Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> right? Somebody likes cars. Now, I really do like cars, but somebody likes cars. I love cars. I sat with a guy for 20 minutes once at an appointment talking about yeah. his car. Yeah. It was a. Right? My favorite car, but <laughs> so guys, I mean let's just let's just get real here. I mean sales, there's a really fine line between when you when you get to the next level in sales beyond what you guys are thinking or you think you're salespeople, there's a fine line between manipulation and not. Right? And don't feel bad about it. It's not like I mean at the end of the day, this person has a need and we're fulfilling that need. Right? They have a need to sell their house and we're providing them a service. We're we're able to fulfill that need for them. Right? So, you know, people talk about ethics and saying we're not doing anything unethical. Right? We're not scamming people. Right? That's not what this is about. That's not what this is about. We're appealing to them. We're in their, and we're making them feel comfortable. Right? So, um, anyways, I, I really encourage you guys to practice this. And even if you're out, if this is the exercise I used to get. If you're at a restaurant, just try to pick, just practice and just try to play into that person's personality style and see if you can't get a discount or see if you can't get something extra added to your meal or a little extra fries or an extra burger or something like that. We used to do that all the time on break. So, I recommend something yeah. as well. Um, I have took probably over a million cards. Yeah. Before I became an investor, I. Um, What's your name, by the way? Crystal. I'm Crystal. Crystal. Thank you, Crystal. Before I became an investor, I um, was a telemarketer. I was a oh. telemarketer and okay. sales. So being a telemarketer, which telemarketer jobs are very, 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 very easy to get. Yeah. But if you have some sort of a confusion with all of this, just go get a telemarketer job for maybe about a month. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> maybe about a month. You'll you figure it out real fast. Oh, yes. You'll oh, yeah. get all the experience that you need to gauge these type of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know, I, know uh, I was reading a book and the guy was an FBI negotiator <laughs> and he wanted to get the job uh, as like an early, you know, a younger guy getting into the negotiations for, yeah. I think, uh, hostage negotiations. And they told him, uh, before you come here, go get a job for six months working on a suicide hotline. Yeah. And, and then come back. There you go. And, you know, stuff like that. That's good experience yeah. for just kind of playing along to what you're yes. saying. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. You really, um, uh, the, 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 do they find that that's really that evenly split among my, 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 my population? I, I'll tell you, I very rarely find people that I uh, um, am similar to. I mean, I can't. You, you, you really think there's 25 percent in each quadrant that that evenly? Well, I, that is evenly I, don't know about, I don't know about evenly distributed, but well, that's like you know, are women and men evenly distributed? I don't I know. Don't, well, you, yeah. you keep on saying 75 percent, but I'm. I'm so generally speaking, if we're if well, you know what? Let's do a little let's do a little game here. Let's do a little game here. How many people do we have in this room? Because this is very I'm very interested in this, Jeff. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Perfect. Let's do a little experiment because I'm an analytical. I'm an analytical. I love this stuff. Thank you, Jeff. I'm salivating over this right now. I don't know, but generally speaking, yes, right? So how many people in this room, be honest guys, don't try to manipulate the numbers now that you know what we're doing. How many people in this room are analyticals? Be both. One, I am two. 
Three, four. There's a lot of analyticals in this room. Nine, ten, eleven. Is eleven? Eleven? Okay. So that's fifty percent. What the hell is analytical? See? How many people in this room are drivers? Don't you have more than one though? It can be a little a combination of both. Yes. One. Dave, you, well, one, numbers. two. Yeah, just Don't worry numbers. about the numbers. I wish I didn't tell you guys what we were doing, because now you're getting... One, though. Pick one. That's what I meant. Your yeah. primary one that you are naturally. Are you a driver? So drivers, put your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right? Okay. How many people in this room are amiables? We got one, for sure. Amiables? <laughs> two? What the hell is amiable? None of these are any better or worse than the others. Remember, a lot of drivers yeah, sure. will have a harder time getting business gotten done because they're not appealing to a lot of population. How many people are our expressives? No, Rob is. Oh. Two. Nobody? Two? Okay, so there's just sampling the room, right? Probably better have a data source of 100 people or not. But there's, there's the numbers. Is a huge room because we're yeah, we're all exactly. Yeah, so you know, obviously, the more you sample it out, you, you probably would see that they, it's, I would guess, it's probably it probably gets very close to equal if you had a, a larger uh, sample of people. I did, it, I did it once where we were at a conference and they they had the four categories, they were different, kind different of names. Of it was uh, for an internship, there's like a thousand people for what kind of, for what kind of uh, um, auditing, consulting, different see, types of stuff. Skewed, but, an but it was still, a, but see, this is skewed too because we're real estate investor group, but right? Evenly split yeah, I mean, there was, yeah, probably a very even amount between the four categories. Yeah. If we were to take a group and just go out, pick 20 people at random, these numbers are going to be much different. There's a reason we're all part of the same tribe here in this group. That's why we're all here today. So it's so it's going to be skewed. But I think just naturally speaking, I think it's probably pretty pretty proportionate. Yeah, go ahead. Are those categories so mutually exclusive that there's no <coughs> way there's anybody that could be like equally free or equally uh, two? You know how the research goes on that? Well, so so what I know is that you naturally are one. You naturally are one. If you get down to the core of it, you are so a one predominant. You are one predominant. Now you could bounce depending on what kind of stress you're under to many different of the categories, right? There's been times where, depending on the stress, I'm an amiable, right? Depending on this, I'm an expressive. Depending on that, I'm a driver. So it just depends on what kind of stress is exerted upon you. Right? If you're in a hostage situation, you, everybody in this room is probably going to become an amiable real fast. You're going to start a lot of flood of emotions and feelings. Right? Maybe. Jeff, maybe not. <laughs> David and I are going to be plotting it like the Matrix, like every exit, every category. If the bullet traveled at this trajectory, if I just went 30 millimeters to the left, I'll be missed. <laughs> So do, you're going to have one dominant, and then you could fluctuate depending on the stress that's um, exerted upon you between the, the other ones. So when we talk about business, in, in a business situation, and the stress that you're involved in, you're going to fluctuate between, you're going to be one of these, and there's no telling what it is you're going to be, like here, generally speaking. David, do you know, so you're an analy analytical, what would you say your girlfriend probably is? Um, she's... Driver slash uh, amiable. Driver slash amiable? Okay. Kind of yeah, so she's a mix. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody here in this room know what they think their significant other may be? Does anyone Would, have it? Is it direct opposite of you for any, anyone? Yeah. How many people in this room, their significant other is a direct opposite of them? Raise your hands high. Yeah, a lot, majority of the room. Do you have a significant other? I do. What do you think he is? I, I think he's between a driver and, and an expressive. Right, and you're an amiable. So, under stress, he's probably, your husband is probably a driver and an expressive, he's probably an expressive. If, if you're fluctuating, you think he's a driver or expressive. So experiment with these guys and get really good at it. 
you're really good at it because this is also if, if anybody in this room is trying to be better at their job you know, how many people in this room have a job right now raise your hands high guys don't be shy do you get along with your boss very well <laughs> very well right so you, I hear people complain about their job and their bosses all the time well what do you think is happening there opposites. you guys are you you guys are repulsing each other you're like magnets put backwards right and so if anybody in this experiment with this if anybody in this room has a problem with their boss right now do this try to identify what personality style they are and appeal to it talk like them walk like them use their rate of speech use their inflections and I bet you you probably be up for a raise in six months Oh, you are. I hear about it all the time. I tell people, just do this. And people come back and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe it. We're best friends now. We're out at the bar drinking. Right? Go ahead. So, I'm a nurse. Oh, cool. Nurse. Nice. Um, so, I work at University of Michigan and we're always doing like personality tests. Cool. So, they took a group of us and it was probably 500 people in the room. Yeah. And they made us take questions. Yeah. And walk in and didn't talk about personality or anything. Yeah. And then, based on the answer to the question, you had to move to different tables. Yeah. Once they figured out, they're like, okay, now you work with this one and this one and this one, but look, there are different tables. Why do you think you can't get along? Yeah. So every day is all about like how to get along. But <coughs> they did, they moved us out. And you don't realize, they're like, oh, yeah. hey, I work with so-and-so, and she's, oh. It's really interesting. That makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Very interesting, guys. I'm telling you, this is real world stuff, man. And people don't think about this stuff. But if, but if you can, what we're talking about is take your ego out of the equation and elevate yourself, guys. Elevate yourself to another level of human existence and take your ego out and stop si trying to say, well, I'm not going to be friends with my boss or I'm not going to try to be nice to my boss. They can go screw themselves, right? Stop that, guys. Yes. Elevate yourself. Right? And realize you're really in control. You're in control of all your experiences on a daily basis. Whether people like you, you get along with them, you don't get along with them. Every time you point a finger, there's three pointing back. If I don't get along with somebody, it ain't their fault. They're just going about, they're not at your level, guys. They don't understand any of this. They're just going about their daily life. Boom, 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 boom. Going through the process. Right? But if you can elevate yourself and get to another level and you can be the bigger person in that situation, right? You can control all of your situations on a daily basis. You got stress in your life, you don't need to have stress in your life. But you're, you're the one at the root of it. We're the one at the root of all the stress and problems we have. You guys got to start to think about that and realize we, right? All these people, ah, these people are idiots. Right? What makes them idiots? They're just going through their daily life. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just being themselves, naturally. Right? Your job would be them. So start to think about it and realize that you can control whatever situation you're in. It just starts with you. It starts with your mindset. It starts with you taking yourself up another level and saying, I'm in control of this. And that includes sales. Okay, guys? So any questions there before we wrap it up? Because I want to get into other questions and stuff that the group may have outside of this. But any questions on the personality sales? Go ahead. How many real estate investors do you think are ADD or ADHD? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> David. David, for sure. 100% is Todd Douglas. Josh? Oh. Josh, right? Todd. Oh, Todd. I'm sorry. I don't know why I thought your name was Josh. Todd. I know, yeah. I know three others that I've worked with that are very ADHD. I, know. I don't know what I am. I'm in a, I'm a different universe. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you so, after, after like two hours behind a desk, I'm like freaking... Yeah, you probably are too. <laughs> probably very common because a lot of people in this room just can't stand working for other people. You know, the goal of a lot of people in this room is to get out from working for the man, right? And to work for yourself. So, um, any other questions on personality styles before we get into just general real estate questions? What can we do to help you guys out? No? And do we have one on Facebook Live? Are there people still, or did they drop off? No, are there yeah. still people on Facebook like Live? People. Go ahead. Not a question, but uh, you can take the disc assessment on TonyRobbins.com, I think it is. Oh, okay. Got That's right, yeah. There's cool. A few, yeah, there's a few good places. Good point. So TonyRobbins.com, you can do a disc assessment. Yeah. Okay. They use TonyRobbins.com yeah. slash disc. Slash disc. Okay. okay. Do they have any books to further like go into figuring out how to 
There, there probably is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have any recommendations for you. I learned it. I follow a, a sales system called the Mike Ferry Sales Training System. It's for real estate agents. That's where I learned it from. Uh, but there, there's probably dozens of books. And it goes deeper than this. If you guys want to explore the next level above personality styles, there's something called NLP. Has anybody heard of NLP? Which is Neuro Linguistic Programming. And that is some scary stuff. Yeah. I took a six month course twice and I understand still about 2% of it even being an analytical. And NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, you can literally talk people in to whatever it is you want them to do. It is wild stuff. I knew a guy that was a master at it. He was my sales coach for a long time. And uh, I took his, he taught the course. It took two six month courses. And I was just like, ooh, this is beyond me. But it's just, it's, it's pattern. It's pattern, speech, recognition, that type of stuff. And it's getting people, remember in sales, we're not selling anybody anything. People have to sell themselves, right? You can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. And so when people say, ah, I could sell this pen to anybody. No, you can't. If the person doesn't want the pen, you're not gonna, you're not gonna force them to buy the pen, right? So um, neuro-linguistic programming gets into that and, and through how you communicate and you're actually forecasting, you're setting them up to where you want them to be. And you're asking them a series of questions in ways that they're gonna end up there and they don't even know it. And then there's different speech patterns, there's just different things that happen during that process that um, you, you can, it's wild stuff. It's like hypnosis almost, but it works. I've seen it in person. Um, we use, I guess, actually, we use a little bit of it yeah. ourselves to a very limited extent. And because David and I, when we focus on sales, we're always focused on the end, where we want the person to be, and asking them a series of questions to get them there. Be careful when you go to a car dealership. That's how they're trying to. Yeah. Because they get paid more money on the financing, so yeah. they can talk you into a comfortable price. <laughs> yeah. That, oh, I'll pay, yeah, I'm cool with paying that's this much a month. Yeah. They'll talk you right into that price, right. and that's where they'll finance you. Yeah. Too. And somebody good at NLPs would plant that seed as soon as that person walks in the door, and then re-harvest it and keep bringing it up throughout that conversation, without you even knowing. They right, just keep on asking yep. questions over and over. Yeah. yeah. So just remember, selling is questions, guys. It's, you know, what questions can we ask to get this person to where we want them to be? David, you had one or two points that you wanted to bring. I think maybe we probably covered them, but did you have one or two? Yeah, so I think the biggest points I want to talk about, talk about were um, make sure you're always talking directly to a decision maker. A lot of people will work through an agent or, you know, even what we're doing now, we work through brokers. Um, and the reason a lot of times those fall through and the reason Dylan and I have kind of a rule, always talk directly to the decision maker and not through someone else, is partially because of these personality types. You're going through <coughs> another channel and that, that message is being lost. You, you're losing yeah. control over it. And they don't understand this. They the middleman doesn't understand, understand this. It. Yeah, the middleman doesn't understand it and your message is getting lost uh, in translation there. So always talk to the decision maker. If you're on the phone with the homeowners, son, you know, nephew, sister, brother, always make a point to try as hard as you can to get directly to the decision maker. That's, that's a very good point. David and I right now are, are master in the apartment systems. And uh, we tell, a lot of it has to deal with your uh, broker relationship more on residential. And like David's saying, you got that broker in the middle and brokers just stand in their own way a lot of times. They just kill deals instead of actually try to get deals done. So David and I will actually go right to the broker and say, no, we're gonna sit down with the seller direct. We'll still pay you your commission, but we want you the hell out of the negotiations. Right? We'll pay your commission. We have no problem with that because you can handle, we'll negotiate it, we'll get the deal done, you can handle the rest. Yeah. Because time after time, deals are not getting done when we have a broker, that third party, trying to be the middleman. They're standing in everybody's way. Yeah, we've right? times where the situations have gotten real testy and then we get in touch with the owner direct and then everything's we, fine. We can solve it with a five-minute yeah. phone call. So. Yeah. Always direct a Brokers are their own worst enemy. Remember guys, as a real estate agent, as a broker, your job is not to be a superhero and defend your client and try to get the best okay. price and terms and, and highest price and terms and I'm gonna protect my client at all cost. No, your job is to facilitate the process. Your job is to not get in the middle. Let the transaction occur naturally. <laughs> Let the buyer and the seller communicate and come to an agreement. You handle the paperwork and the process. That was one of the first things I learned as a real estate agent. You're not there to be a superhero. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you protecting? 
right? And I'll tell you, in residential, it's going to be hard for a lot of agents to give up their control yeah. of the situation. So Josh actually just asked that on Facebook. He said, how do you get the decision maker if an agent's in the way? Um, I mean, residential, it's kind of difficult. Well, so remember, back in the, people don't remember this, and we're young, but uh, back in the day, there may be people in this room who remember, you used to sit down at a kitchen table with a buyer and a seller, and you had the real estate agent there. It's perfectly okay and common in residential real estate to say, I want to present the offer to the seller. People have lost sight of that mm -hmm. in this world. People have lost sight of that. That's how it used to be done, guys. That's how it used to be done. This was before my, even in the 80s, right? I was born in 86, even in the 80s. It was that, were we buying real estate in the 80s? No, you were like a nuclear physicist or something, right? You were like smashing atoms or something. <laughs> but that's how real estate should be, guys. We've lost really, we've really lost this interaction, this human interaction that we have. And it's like, don't be scared to say, I'd like to go to the seller's house and present my offer in residential real estate. Hard to do, though. I used to do it all the time. Yeah, because now it's not the norm. Now it's everybody, we communicate through text. It's hard to get people together. Or get people together, we communicate through emails, and it's like, how the hell can any of this happen through a text or an email? It can't, right? And emotions get sideways because somebody read a text wrong or who knows what happened. Start taking control, guys, and start actually communicating with other human beings, right? Stop hiding behind the text and the emails and stuff. But it's perfectly normal. I used to do it all the time. I'm a very good example of it, where I would, um, I, as an agent, I would just let the trans. I never got in the way. I would let the transaction occur naturally. I wouldn't give my opinion either way. I'd say, I'm here to handle the paperwork. Here's numbers, here's facts. You guys make the decision. Yeah, right, that's what this is about. The buyer wants to buy the house, the seller wants to sell the house. My opinion doesn't matter, and it shouldn't matter. I'm not an attorney. I'm not here to say, what legalities are in this transaction. I'm a real estate agent, I'm a facilitator. What do most real estate agents say or PA say? Contact, legal, advice. If you don't understand the legalities of this contract that you're in, don't ask me. Because if I start giving advice on it, what do I do? I open myself up to liability. Right? You're just there to facilitate the process. That's what people don't understand, is when I sign the purchase agreement, what happens next? That's what you're there for. This is what happens next. Right? I set up your inspection. Yeah. Go ahead. You're also providing comps, though, depending on who you work for. Sure, that's part of your service. Right. Absolutely. You an opinion as to what the value right. of the house is and what you should And you let the seller and the buyer make their decision on that. And we used to go through and we used to say, here's a house that's just like yours. It's a three bedroom, two bath, 1,100 square feet. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, what did it sell for? 210000 Great. Here's another one. Three bedroom, two bath, it's just like yours. I'm asking them, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, what did it sell for? 215000 Then when we get three, three or four comps, I say, based on everything you've seen here today, Jeff, what do you think your house is worth? Well, probably 215000 Fantastic. Would you like to sign a listing agreement today for 215000 I didn't tell them at all. Right? Same with a buyer. If you're representing a buyer, what should I put in on a house? Well, buyer, here's four comps that are very similar to yours. A three bedroom, two bath, 1,100 square feet. What did it sell for? Boom. So, Mr. and Ms. Buyer, based on everything you've seen here today, what do you think you should offer? Right? When I represented buyers, which was rare because I was a listing agent, it was a full price offers. What do you think I should go? Can I get a deal? Let me tell you this, man. Everything in this market's a deal. If the market continues to move up, if you're buying today, you got a deal. Right? <laughs> right? You got a deal. <laughs> okay? So full price offer. We're in a competitive market. What do you think I should put an offer in at? I think you should go 5000 over what they're asking. You ever been in a situation where you put an offer on the house and there were three others and you lost? Yeah. Do you want to be in that situation again? No. So what do you think you should offer? But do you see how I didn't tell them anything? I didn't tell them anything. I said, has there ever been a, that's NLP. Has there ever been a situation where you've been in and you put an offer and you've been competing with others and you lost? That's every day in this market, right? That's every day in this market. So I don't need to tell you if they're asking 240, what do you think you should offer? So that you don't lose. You don't want to be a loser, do you? <laughs> <laughs> this is real. This is, these are real conversations. I'm not exaggerating when I say this stuff. I might tell somebody you don't want to be a loser, do you? 255 with the cash bridge. Yeah. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so that's 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 advanced sales stuff. And if you guys can grasp this concept, man, you're gonna kill it in anything that you're doing, whether it be this real estate business, whether it be your work, whether it be your jobs, whatever it is that you're doing. Okay, so hopefully you guys picked up some nuggets from this. I mean, this is like gold, man. I don't know why people don't pay attention to this. You know, people, they think of sales and they're like, ah, I'm not a sales guy. Look, we're all sales guys, right? We're all selling every day. We're selling ourselves every single day, whether it be to our significant others, whether it be to other sales people, whether it be wherever you're at, we're all selling at all times. We're selling ourselves, right? If you dressed up today and you did make up, put your earrings on and you put all this fancy stuff on, what are you doing? You're selling people that you look good. Right? <laughs> you look good. Right? Now, some people don't care about any of that, right? I'm a very frugal person. I don't care about, I'm not a materialistic person. I don't care about materials or any of that type of stuff. But generally speaking, everybody's selling themselves every single day. So whether you think you're a salesperson or not, you are. You were born a salesperson. Right? We're in a, we're in a society where if you want to live, you got to sell. You got to sell yourself. In some fashion, you're selling your skills to an employer to get a paycheck, aren't you? And, and I got something. Go ahead. You know, a lot of people call customers or our, our future clients, and they're, they're very formal, you know. Yeah. Me, personally, when I call them, I'm not formal. <laughs> I'm like, hey, John, what's going on, John? How's everything over there? He's like, what? <laughs> Hello? Uh, who, yeah. Who's the, like this crystal, you know, crystal. Uh, yeah. Houses, but you know. Yeah. You're like, oh wow. So it's like the everything is dropped at that oh, point. Yeah. He's like, wow. Who yeah. Is this girl. <laughs> find out more. About Depends her. on the person, though, because if the person's like that, yes, right? It does. But yeah. Then after you, whatever they say next gauges your next. Whatever yeah. You're gonna say you kind of do them. That's when I do the mirror. Right? Yeah. But exactly. Oh yeah, I get the attention immediately. First, trick me first names. Yeah. And Good. Then I find out they're a doctor. Then I'm okay, doctor. Yeah. Exactly. Very good. Go ahead. Do, do you ever catch yourself in a conversation trying to stroke somebody's ego that's that type of person? You know? Oh, God, yes. Uh, and expressive? I was, talking to, yeah, I was talking to an attorney outside of... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That, that person is the world's greatest attorney. You didn't know that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I told him that. I told him that. And see, yeah. and you're part of his tribe, aren't you? Yep. He likes you. Yeah, he'll do a little free work. For you got to keep you around because you're complimenting him every time you're around. Ninety percent of real estate agents. Are and attorneys, by the way, are expressive. Yeah, a lot of them. Ninety-nine percent yeah. of agents are the number one agent in yeah. the state of Michigan. So, <laughs> stroke, stroke their ego. <laughs> if you look at real estate agents' cards, it's number one. They're all. They're all number one. Everybody's number one. We're all number one. <laughs> Right, number one in what? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Do you know what it takes? Let me make, I like making fun of real estate agents. I'm a real estate agent myself. Do you know what it takes to be in the top 1%? Everybody says I'm in the top 1% of real estate agents in the world. Do you know what it takes to be in the top 1% according to NAR, the National Association of Realtors? What? Anybody know? Take a guess. How many, how many houses do you have to sell a year to be in the top 1%? Well, depends on where you are. Yeah, it depends on where you are. Four. You have to sell more than four houses a year wow. to be in the top 1% oh, that, that, of real estate agents. <laughs> so think about that next time Susie comes over to your house from Century 21. I'm the top 1%. So you sell four I got so excited when I, I first started with Coal Banker. I got so excited. I hit four I sold four houses that year. I said, this was 2006 when I first started real estate, right? I said, I'm the top 1%, baby. <laughs> I made it. I made it. I got a whopping twelve thousand dollars in commissions. I made it. Right? So I don't know how we got on that topic, but that's funny. I don't like I don't I don't like the whole system behind realtors and real estate agents and all that stuff. It's it's pretty silly. Anybody here a licensed agent? Yeah. Did you get the did you get the email the other day where your text and your fonts have to be the same size as your brokers? Yeah. Right? Like what are we worried about here? Like these are the things we're worried about is like what your font size is on your advertising. Brokers worry about it. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. The broker, but the broker doesn't want the agent to be a brand. But in the bigger picture of things, what are we doing? Well, that, that's why. Yeah. The broker, the broker doesn't want that agent to be able to I know. To I just wonder I know a person who has a truck. That's silly. A moving van with their picture on it. And then the company's logo is on the door. I come back <laughs> right. And I'm like, how is this going to ever? Yeah. It, yeah, it doesn't. So I don't want to get into that topic, but that's, 
So let's get into your guys' business because we usually um, dedicate two hours to this, so it's 11.26. So anybody here got a question about real estate investing, a transaction, uh, where are you at, what can I do to help move you forward? I've seen a lot of stuff, so use me um, as, a, as a resource, okay? Oh, we got questions here? Yes. Okay. Well, we don't, I'm just gonna keep these for a while. Anybody have a burning question that we need to address yeah, right yeah. now? Everyone? A burning <laughs> question. Do you guys have any questions you wanna get that out of here? Everybody's got it all figured out? No, but how, in, commercial, <laughs> in commercial, how are you getting around the broker that's the listing agent? Well, commercial is, is, is a little easier because they're business people mm -hmm. and they're not really, they, they don't give it a lot, they don't give a crap about a lot of stuff, right? And they just want the deal to get done. And so how do we get around? We just say we want to sit down with the seller direct and present our offer. That's how we do it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and you can do that in residential too. And people are going to say, whoa, you're weird, man, right, in residential. But that's how it used to be done. And there's, there's nothing that says you can't do that. It's just the world is trying to hide behind phones and texts and emails nowadays. And it's like we need to communicate with each other. But yeah, you just how do you get around them? You just say, I want to present my offer to the seller. And usually David and I, we've done this now in a lot of stuff. We'll sit down with the top guys. We'll just sit down and say, let's take you out to lunch. Right? We want to talk about real estate. We want to figure out a way that makes sense for everybody. Let's get this deal done at the end of the day. Right? Can we have you come out to a lunch? We know your time's <coughs> valuable. Or can we come to you? But we we absolutely, and we tell the brokers, look, no disrespect to you. We're going to pay you your full commission. Just let us deal with the negotiation. And then you handle the process. Thank you. Good question. Did you have one? Yes. Um, I'm wondering how can I find off-market um, multifamilies, maybe 30 to 100 units? What's a good way to best, find those? Best way to do that is you sign up for CoStar.com. You don't need to be a licensed agent. It's the commercial database okay. for property. Expensive, yeah. Very expensive. It's like oh. five, six hundred bucks a month. Oh. However, it has all on market, off market, commercial property, multifamily, residential, retail, and the owner's direct contact from information built in. And you have a dedicated representative where if the information is not in there and inaccurate, you call your representative with CoStar, they get you the accurate information. They'll get you on the phone with the, with the seller. I don't want to see you have the old market. What's that? You mentioned you have off-market also? On-market and off-market. Every commercial property in the state and the country. It basically has a listing for every single ad, every property address. Like this building, oh, even though it's yeah. not for sale, you'll be able to click on it and see it's like sales history, it's tax data, square yep. footage, all that kind of stuff. CoStar.com. This information to, to CoStar, I mean, how They own LoopNet, and they basically have teams that just collect. They have teams of analysts that just collect just I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people on the back end just constantly collecting data. And then it's also user driven. So if we come across a property and they don't have data for it, we can reach out to them. They say, oh, we didn't have that data. They go research and get the data and put it. So it's constantly living and breathing on its own. Um, but also every time we're in a digital world. So nowadays, every time a transaction is occurring on a piece of real estate, it's being tracked. Everybody's being tracked. Yeah. Everything. I see Redfin. They keep they keep their records pretty updated, though. Not you know when I look at sure. Redfin. Red yeah, I've heard of that. <coughs> but yeah, coast. Getting closer to brokers. Would brokers have that information as far as uh, off market property listings or people that don't want to be? Uh, so usually they have what they call their pocket listings or their clients that, and they may have deals that are coming up. So we use a lot of broker relationships as well too. Okay. You know, what deals do you have coming up? Can you reach out to me first before you list it? That's the goal with the brokers. If it's already on the market, it's typically too late. Right, right. Right? Now, now uh, once you do find something, if I, once I do find something that's off market, um, yeah. do I just sign up like I do a single family? Or I just, you know, do you, uh, negotiate and present a contract to just the same <coughs> way? Is it the same process? Or? Well, a little bit different in, the, in commercial than it is um, single family, residential. In so. In commercial, it's going to be an LOI. We always start with an LOI. Right. And the reason for that is, is because in commercial, unlike residential, you start spending legal fees right out of the gate when you get into a PA. Uh, commercial PAs, you don't want to slap together off of an online form, right? Because there's a lot of things that can go wrong real fast, and it's really expensive. So in commercial, we usually start with an LOI um, because it's, it's, it's non-binding, and it sets the terms up front. And then we'll say, usually like Dave and I will say, there's a 10 day period between you accepting our LOI and us negotiating a final PA that you can't entertain other offers or continue to market the property. Oh, okay. 
right? And, and then what happens is, is once we all agree to the loose terms and the LOI, then our attorneys and their attorneys go into negotiating the final purchase agreement. Because they, they can be very complex. Right. These particular apartments that I'm in reference to probably have yeah. been vacant for 20 years. I yeah, mean, is it, sure. I mean, there's no establishment with, you know, how much this unit is producing or the loss in the amount of years or... Mm -hmm. So what's the question? On that. So, um, well, I guess I don't have a question. Yeah, I have to, I have buyers for them that's, that's like you know ready to buy, but I just need to find them. Coast. And I'm looking at all the buildings that don't have signs on the side. So yeah. I'm like, who are these people? Co-stars to answer that. You'll know instantly who owns it and their contact information, okay. address and phone number, okay. instantly with CoStar. Okay. That's the only way you should go. It's very expensive, yeah. and they're very complicated people to deal with, okay. uh, but uh, you'll get it. Now we're talking about you know what's 500 bucks a month if you're doing a deal that's going to make you 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand, right. right? So you're up in your game a little bit. So, Do you okay. Have to have commercial? What's that? CoStar is only commercial. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so your residential would be your MLS, and right? The the real company. Mm -hmm. Yep, all the direct phone numbers. You remember who we're dealing with? Now we're dealing with business people, business transactions. So now these are businesses that you can also just Google their business a lot of times and go to their website and call their office just if you can call our office. Number. Yep. So, are you able to do a search by like uh, if there's an owner or not? Does he have all these data as well? But to make sure that like what you get from the stability for residential, can you do the same cost on? Say that one more time. Like if you go and do a search, give me all the properties that actually have all the cash and free, uh, like free. Oh, uh, I don't think no. Can you do that in cost on? No, because a lot of those in the commercial world, they'll even not disclose what the purchase prices are and stuff. They keep a lot of that stuff. They keep very private as well too. You'll see often that they don't even disclose sometimes purchase prices. Like go Google Dan Gilbert and all the stuff that he's bought. It's all undisclosed. He doesn't even disclose what his lease rates. Doesn't even disclose what his lease rates are. So in commercial, it's a little bit different. They don't disclose. They try to. A lot of people try to actually not disclose that type of information. So I don't think you can really sort by equity like you would in residential. Um, but the, any other filter you can imagine, like we target in multifamily, just like residential, we go after absentee people, so people who own properties in apartments here in Michigan that live out of state. Right? We go after them first because they're going to be much more inclined, we talk about motivated sellers, to want to stop managing an asset here in Michigan if they're in California. Right? You find those people are much more tired of managing stuff first. We target those people first. And so, yes, you can break the list down. You can say all absentees, all owners who live out of state. So you can, you can, you can break it down. It gets pretty specific, but good questions. Is your 10-day clause a separate addendum with your LOI? It's right, built right into the LOI. Built right in. Typically, yep. LOIs never get signed, to be completely honest. LOIs yeah. rarely. You'll present it to them. They'll see it. And then, if, you know, then it really is kind of like a verbal discussion from there. And then, uh, and then you kind of go right into making a PA. I've, I have not once had anyone sign an LOI and send it back. I never sign LOIs because although they're non-binding, if somebody really wanted to, they could tie up in court over an LOI, no matter how, no matter if it says it's non-binding or not. They really can. So. Yeah, LOIs are just really loose. Yeah. They're just they're just designed to just almost. We treat a lot of times like a gentleman's agreement. Yeah. Sure. And a lot of sellers do too. It's more than a verbal, and it just. Outlines everything and yeah. professional. So yeah, I never sign them when I send them over. I just send it off. Yeah, that's pretty common. It's a good point. Yeah. You do in this day and age, do you use non-disclosure statements? Um, I'm not sure. Non-disclosure. NDIs. Oh, you mean like a confidentiality agreement? Yeah, well, a lot of times. Yeah. If Absolutely. You're talking about a property with, um, say, a broker or even sometimes a lender if you don't know them well. Uh, <coughs> or you're sending it around to a buyer, always use a co confidentiality and maybe agreement to not compete. Re not commercial not. world is wolf eat wolf eat wolf's children. And I know Jeremy says that. He got that from our podcast I did with him where I was describe, trying to describe the best way to deal with commercial real estate. It's wolf eat wolf eat the baby wolf eats the baby wolf. Like it's, it's buyer beware. And so you got to do your due, due diligence. It's very... Um, it's 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 a whole different ball game, you know, when you're dealing with um, commercial stuff. And the reason why David's saying we have people sign uh, non-disclosures and confidentiality agreements is because they get whiff of a deal, they'll stab you right in the back. They'll tell their buddy who's got a lot more money than you will come in and whack you out of that deal, 
right? Oh, did you hear these guys are working on this deal? Boom, thank you, right? So um, we always have people sign confidentiality agreements, non-disclosures. And then on the seller side though too, they want you to sign them because they don't want, this is a business for them, they don't want their tenants jumping ship if they know they, they're selling the building. Who knows what could happen, sure. right? So yeah. Confidentiality agreement that you mentioned to get signed with who? With the All the parties involved: brokers, sellers, do. buyers. In, until you, yep. Once you got under contract, there's no need for it. Yeah. But if you're talking with people before you got under contract. I was, I was a lot of times the seller. So when you're going to make an offer on a commercial property, an apartment, where do you even start if you don't have the financials? It's a business, right? And so we got to look at what are the operating expenses, what are the income, what are the rent rules, and they won't send you that information unless you sign a confidentiality agreement that you won't disclose it. People don't want that information out there in the world. Do you go back two or three years on the actuals? Dave, that's probably a better question for you. What do you usually look for? Two? two? Yeah, I mean, more, more the better, but you don't need more than two. Have you experienced any um, sellers that um, bump up rates? Like, uh, to, to increase their NOI. Manipulate their oh, P&Ls? Oh, yeah. Every time. Yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> Every if, one of if them. If you go back three, <laughs> three years in history, you can see that, that justification yes. didn't work for them, um, well, other than I mean, the marketing. Really, I mean, most of, well, to be honest, most of the time, um, it's it's the actual numbers. They're just going into like, their property management software and printing off their rent roll or whatever their operating statements are, because the last thing they want is for you to get it under contract at a price that you think is good but it's based off fake numbers, and then you go and due diligence, figure out that the numbers were lies, and then they've just wasted their time and yours. So they, it actually a lot of times can hurt them to give you fake numbers. Yeah. And so uh, most of the time, the numbers are gonna be real. I just never trust numbers on like brokers pro formas, because those are just slapped together and they're meant to just, they're just fluff. Yeah, if a broker sends you a package on a commercial property for sale, forget I, I about it. I always ask for actuals. And a lot of times yeah. they'll say, oh, it's in the offering, offering memorandum. I said, nope, I'm not, I'm not looking at it until you send it. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of times, they'll pull, a lot of these owners will plug in personal expenses in their P&L statements and things like that. And David's like a forensic scientist, and he pulls out all this stuff. And you'll know, the more commercial properties you do, you'll know this type of building. It, it, Jeff, you own commercial buildings. You own apartments as well. Just the one. Just the one. You'll know that, um, you'll know what typical operating expenses should be for like a Class C building in Livonia or whatever. It may be 30% of income, maybe 40% of income. You get used to that, you'll know. So you don't have to necessarily rely on what their numbers are. You can build an offer, an educated offer based on what I'm really concerned with, and I don't know about David, but my biggest concern is occupancy. Verifying, is it actually 92% occupied? And then you, everything else you can figure out on your own, really. Okay, thank you. A, a guy, he's a realtor's brother who has, he says he has these off market apartments. I drove to a few of them. Yeah. My thing, my, my buyer, he would only, he, he told me basically if I have a, if, if I pull up these apartments and they're listed, I'm not doing no type of business with you, period, under any circumstances. Type okay. Of thing. So this guy that's giving me these apartments, I have no way of actually finding out if they're listed or not. I have no way. Obviously, you want to buy anything that's listed. My buyer? Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I probably should have asked him that, but. Um, so your buyer said that <coughs> you send him properties that are listed. He's not doing business with. He said he don't want it right. He. he but yeah, he just doesn't want something. listed stuff because it's 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 dead at that point. Once it's on the market, he wants off market stuff. He wants strictly off yeah. market. My thing is, yeah. I don't know if these apartments are on market or off market or not. I mean, I don't see a sign on a building. So, com yeah, commercial real estate's really, really weird because, because oftentimes we find, and you look at more than I do on, Co on CoStar, but oftentimes we'll find it on CoStar where it says it's for sale and it's not for sale. Or we'll find it on CoStar where it says it's for sale and it's not, and it is for sale. But CoStar is the answer to that. If you had a CoStar subscription, you'll plug it in there. You'll know if it's on or off market. But even that, and David, correct me if I'm if you want to add to this. But I have seen that it's, it's it can even be skewed there. Well, I mean, so if your buyer he just wants off market because he doesn't want to deal with like brokers or agents or what's in, what's that? I, 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 mean, I guess maybe competition or I mean I don't know. If he's, if he's a legit buyer. He'll want any deal. It's a good deal. Yeah, on market, off market. I mean, if you find a good deal that's on market, it shouldn't matter to him. Yeah, I mean, but if it does, then, I mean, I, that wouldn't be the only buyer I work with then. 
Would be oh, yeah. Place. I, would, I would say, hey. I say, how about we do this? How about we do this, Mr. Bruce? How about I just focus on finding a good deal, whether it's on market or off? Yeah, Does that make sense? And I would tell them, hey, if I come across an off market deal, I'll bring it to you, but I'm not wasting all my time just looking for off market deals because. You know, then you're spinning your wheels. Off. You got to ask him what's important to him. What type of returns are he looking to? Is he looking to get on this investment? Okay. And you can accomplish that through on and off market deals. The two deals we just closed on, the two partners we just closed on, they were asking what 100, 150 thousand over. They were listed at like, you know, 100 thousand over on the on CoStar than what we actually bought them for. So don't let that scare you. Right. If you go on there and it's listed at 900 thousand and it's really worth seven. That shouldn't stop you from from writing an offer and doing a deal. Right. You know, it's not like residential. Yeah, I put an offer like three million under what they're asking because, I mean, I, I look at their asking price to see where they're at to gauge where they're at. But I mean, at the end of the day, I don't I don't care yeah. what they're asking. There's a number that works for me and my, exactly. my company, my investors. And that's what's going to work. If it doesn't, then residential is a different world. If you're on the MLS and you see a seller who's asking 120 and the house is worth 100, they're delusional. <laughs> Don't even waste your time. Don't even waste your time because no, they're you're, they're not going to you're not you're not going to get anywhere. But commercial is not that way. Okay. Commercial is not that way. Where, where's that? How are we doing on time? I want to maybe take one or two from. Does Facebook have a question? Yeah. Facebook, welcome everybody. Hope you've been hanging out with us. Does anybody on Facebook have a question? Um, Let's take one. Well, we answered one already. Let's see. Uh, what is the name of the list that you're talking about? Yeah, What's that? CoStar. CoStar, you got that? Yeah. Um, he answered his own question. Josh said, can you still go around to the, uh, directly to the seller if the agent is completely against it? So can you like go around a, a listing agent? Wait, say that again, sorry, I was reading this. If, if a single family home is listed, can you go around the agent and go direct to seller? No. Okay. So the answer is no. Who, who did that come from? Uh, Josh Smith. Yeah, not, not in residential. You gotta go through the agent. Now, if I weren't a licensed agent or a licensed broker, I may test the waters on that. <laughs> okay? But as a licensed agent and broker, you cannot do that. If he's not a licensed agent and broker, I'm not going to say don't test the waters. Did you have a question? I don't know if you went over it. Oh. All right, so a lot of these questions, guys, we'll wrap up here in a second, but a lot of these questions that you asked, um, w David and I will answer them. Um, uh, we'll do it. We, ha we shoot a weekly video called The Real Deal. It's on our YouTube page. Um, and these are really great questions for that series. And so we usually pick three or four and answer them on that series. We try to shoot one every Wednesday. If you guys don't see one go up on Wednesday, that means we didn't have enough questions. Okay? So when we, ha when we accumulate enough questions, we shoot it on Wednesday and we answer it. And so all these questions that you guys asked here, if we didn't get to them today, we will answer them on that series. We take three or four of them, we answer it every Wednesday, we shoot the video. David usually posts it that night or the next day, okay? And that's on our YouTube channel. You can just uh, search Dylan Borland and it's on our YouTube channel. And then also, as you guys see, we record all of this stuff. So just like we're talking about personality styles here today, Excuse me. I did a one-off 20-minute video on our YouTube channel in depth on personality styles. It's on there. Right? This has been recorded. It's on Facebook Live, so you guys can go back and watch it. A lot of great content that I don't think you guys are aware of. We record everything we do and a lot of the questions we get and put them on our YouTube channel. So if you guys are hungry for more information or you're new in this business, like a question on here is, how do I start wholesaling? Right? Um, there, there's some great content on that YouTube channel, right? But we will answer it on here as well. But one in here really struck me. I wanted to answer now. Number eight, are you still finding motivated sellers in this market? Who asked that? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Okay. So absolutely. Motivated sellers are in every market. And what we call it is the three Ds. Divorce, death, and destitution. People are always dying. Divorce is on the rise, and people are going broke thanks to the way the U.S. economy is set up, <clears throat> right? That is always happening, and it's a very debt-driven economy is what I mean by that, right? People are always, we call it the three Ds, there are always people who have to sell. 
and an up market, down market, sideways market, whatever you're saying, there is always people that have to sell. There's motivated sellers. So you get what you focus on. You get what you focus on. Yesterday was a good day. Um, <laughs> a lot of people die? <laughs> taxes were due. Yeah, tax we, 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 we there you go. Oh, wow. the, See? She had to pay the taxes. She couldn't. We could. Property taxes or? Property yeah. Taxes. Yeah, see? Yeah, tax, tax, tax deadlines, when tax oh, deadlines are coming up, you get a lot of motivation. When tax deadlines are coming up, your friend, your friend Jeff is there to help. <laughs> they didn't have the money, but we did. Because Jeff is just like me. <laughs> no, that's a good point, though, Jeff. That was 20, that was 20 grand in taxes. That was a good deal. Destitution broke, right? We got a deal in Southgate. We picked up, uh, prior to the tax deadline, the people inherited the house from their mother, free and clear. It is 90, worth 95000 in Southgate. They owe 12000 Were you here for this deal? They owe 12000 in back taxes. They sold us the property for the 12000 back taxes, and all we did is pay their first month's rent and security deposit on an apartment to move them out. We are into this deal for less than fifteen grand, and it sold for ninety five. People get pretty motivated. <laughs> so they were broke. They were broke, right? So destitution, death, divorce, destitution, broke. People always, always, always need to sell. And you get what you focus on. So if you're focused on finding people that have to sell in zero to seven days, you're going to get more of that into your life. If you're focused on people who have to sell three, four, five months down the road, what are you going to have? A bunch of people who need to sell three, four, five months down the road, right? So you get, it's, it's a law of attraction. When I always say this, when you're in the market for a new car, let's say you're in the market for a Ford Mustang, what do you see on the road everywhere? You see Ford, but man, I don't know if so many people have Ford Mustangs. It's the same concept in business. You get what you focus on. Okay? So let's wrap it up there.